Hello, this is Dr. Drew Moffat, and this is another uh, installment of our Facebook Live series. Um, today's topic is on the Receptiva DX test. This is a relatively new test. Uh, I believe it just came out in uh, November of last year, and uh, so there's starting to be a buzz about that, and uh, so I thought it would be good to review that test a little bit. It's a very new test, so there are many things that we don't know about it, but I wanted to kind of go through it and try and give some idea of when it should be used and how it might be used. So what the test is, is it is a uh, test that's done on a sample of the lining of the uterus. So what is done is there is a what's called an endometrial biopsy. An endometrial biopsy is a procedure that can be done in the office and essentially a tube is placed through the cervix into the uterus and a sample of the lining of the uterus is taken. It has to be done at a particular time in the cycle or at a particular time when there's been some uh, preparation of the uterus done so that um, the test can be performed under the proper circumstances. Um, and uh, it's a little uncomfortable test. It's not an extremely invasive test, but it does involve this tube going into the uterus and pulling back on a plunger and aspirating some cells. And so there's some cramping involved in that procedure. Once the sample is obtained, then it is put in a, uh, so a container uh, to transport it to the lab. And then the lab does a uh, special molecular test looking for a specific marker for a protein called BCL6. And um, to see, uh, and then specifically you wanna do that test around the time that implantation is supposed to be taking place. So uh, as a little bit of background, progesterone is a, you know, felt to be essential for the establishment of a pregnancy and what it appears that this BCL6 does is it seems to be a marker for progesterone resistance so that progesterone uh, one of the things it does is suppress inflammation and it isn't able to do that as effectively because of this resistance that is uh, resulting from the presence of this BCL6 marker and uh, studies have shown that people who have confirmed endometriosis uh, were more likely to have this particular marker in their lining of the uterus than people who did uh, not have confirmed endometriosis when they had a surgery done. There was also a study that was done looking at a subset of people who had the test done and it was positive and then had a laparoscopic examination. There were 65 people and uh, they found that in 61 of those people, they had a confirmed abnormality. Most of the time, the abnormality was endometriosis. Um, and in three cases it was a hydrosalpix and so and then in only one case out of the 65 patients was uh, the laparoscopy showed everything to be normal so that was pretty persuasive that this um, test could be a marker for um, a um, finding on laparoscopy of endometriosis. Now studies have shown in the past that uh, people who have endometriosis, that endometriosis can be a cause of infertility. Now the gold standard for diagnosing endometriosis has always been to do this surgery called a laparoscopy. And it's an outpatient surgery, but it does involve undergoing general anesthesia, it does involve having um, sharp probes pass through your abdominal wall to allow you to look 
and inspect uh, the, ca the abdominal cavity to see if endometriosis is there. So it is a, a surgery. And because um, that it, uh, because it was a surgery, um, what had evolved um, is that people would try to avoid the surgery and just move on to treatment. So for example, when I started um, practice 25 years ago, pretty much part of the normal routine of a diagnostic workup was that pretty much everybody got a diagnostic laparoscopy. Well, you know, surgery's not cheap and it's not without small risks. And so over time, the desire was to skip that surgery step and go right to treatment. And so we would do low, what we call low-tech treatments, like just inseminations or something. And then later on, um, if that didn't work, people would go to in vitro fertilization. And so people would be doing these treatments without really knowing for sure if they had endometriosis or not. So what this test uh, potentially does is allow us to have a non-invasive way to find out if somebody is at high risk of having endometriosis or not. And that study I just uh, talked to you about with the 65 patients is at least a preliminary test that is very suggestive that this test can be a non-surgical test for endometriosis. Now this is just one study that I know of and so as with most things in medicine you want to have many different and larger studies to really confirm that this test can become part of a normal routine evaluation for endometriosis. Um, what uh, some more studies have shown um, that uh, when people move on to something like in vitro fertilization, it was always felt that in vitro fertilization was a good treatment for endometriosis, which it is if you'd look at people who have uh, endometriosis and haven't been able to get pregnant. Um, if you do in vitro fertilization on those people, you'll get very reasonable pregnancy rates, like around 50%. Um, there was a very good study done that took a group of people and randomly assigned them. These were all people who had known endometriosis and randomly assigned them to just go straight into an IVF cycle or to first undergo some sort of a treatment for endometriosis. In this case, it was taking a medicine to suppress the endometriosis. And the group that got randomized to just go straight to IVF, they had a reasonable pregnancy rate around 50%. But the people who um, got randomized to the treatment had a higher pregnancy rate. I think it was around 70%. So that showed that there was a group of people who IVF alone was not helping and that they would get a higher pregnancy rate uh, if they had some sort of a suppression treatment. So um, what do we do in people who haven't had that diagnosis yet? So another study that just came out uh, recently was looking at um, doing a, a group of people who had the test done and then the test that we're talking about here, the receptiva diagnosis test for the BCL6 marker, they had the test done and they went, then went into treatment. And the test just simply looked at uh, how many people had uh, pregnancies if they had the test positive, showing that they had this marker, and how many people had babies when they didn't have the marker. Remember, the mar having the marker is a bad thing. And so in that particular study, um, they showed that people who had the marker positive, there were six out of, I think, 52, which is an 11% live birth rate. So people who had IVF but had the marker only had a pregnancy rate of around 11.5%. And then the group that um, did not have the marker, there were 17 of those people and 10 got pregnant, which was a pregnancy rate of 58.8%. And that was statistically significant, 11% compared to 
uh, you know, 59%. Uh, obviously, this is a small study with uh, a relatively small group in the control group. Um, but it's, it's very uh, interesting and very impressive. So we have this new test now that might be uh, something that can be used to help us decide who has endometriosis and who might benefit from some treatment before uh, going on to uh, a infertility treatment, meaning who would benefit from suppression of endometriosis. Now, the most common way to suppress endometriosis medically is to take a medicine called a GnRH agonist or Lupron and uh, take that for two or three months to suppress the endometriosis. There are other types of medications that can be used also, but that is the main one. So the idea is perhaps we could do the test and if it's positive, then go ahead and treat somebody to suppress the endometriosis. So exactly when to do that is what is going to be a, a point of debate. So there are different ways that this test could be done. One way to do the test would be to do it on everybody as part of a normal uh, workup for endometriosis and if it's found then give a treatment to suppress the endometriosis and then go into some sort of a treatment. Okay, That strategy is certainly suggested by the test but there hasn't been a large uh, study looking directly at that approach. The other approach would be to before somebody does in vitro fertilization since you could get a higher pregnancy rate doing the test in people that are about to do in vitro fertilization and if it's positive go ahead and proceed with treatment. The other approach would be to say um, for people who have known endometriosis trying to decide if that person is the kind of person that would be that needs to have suppression because remember there are people who can get pregnant can get pregnant just fine with endometriosis and so perhaps to find that group of people who can't get pregnant uh, with endometriosis and then only give them suppression. So perhaps you uh, in people who have a diagnosis of endometriosis you would do that test first and then decide. Um, and then the other approach that is probably more commonly being suggested is to take people who have had uh, failure with in vitro fertilization. So they've done an in vitro fertilization cycle, they have failed, and now they are uh, you know, wondering why it failed. And maybe that group would be a, a very good group to start with to uh, test them, find out if they have the problem, and then go ahead and suppress with endometriosis. So there's lots of different options about how to use this test. And we're in the process now of kind of exploring what to be, what is the best thing to do. Currently at ARMS what we're doing is for people who have had an implantation failure. So for example, let's say we've done IVF, we've tested the embryos and we have a normal embryo that's chromosomally normal by doing pre-implantation genetic screening. And if you don't know what that is, I have videos that talk about that. But anyway, we put in a normal embryo into the uterus and they haven't gotten pregnant. Why didn't they get pregnant? Well, maybe we want to, before putting another embryo back, do this test and see if they have an abnormality. And if they do, then suppress it. So there are a lot of details that we need to work through about exactly who to do this test on. But certainly, this is a very promising test. And I think it's worth bringing up any time we're discussing uh, how to move forward. The problem with the test is that it involves doing what's called a pilot cycle where you take a month off and you do this endometrial biopsy at a specific time. The other problem is it's not an inexpensive test. It's about roughly $650 to have that test done. That's just for the laboratory fee. Then you have to pay your doctor to do the endometrial biopsy to obtain the tissue. And so uh, because it uh, involves somewhat of an invasive test and somewhat of an expensive test, there needs to be careful thought into how quickly to jump in to having that done on everybody, especially since probably right now it's not covered. A uh, question came up. Um, 
Oh, just somebody who I had gotten pregnant sent me a note. Thank you. That's very nice. Um, anyway, that is the story on the uh, Receptiva DX test. Um, and uh, if any of you have questions about that, feel free to contact me. The way you can contact me, again, my name is Dr. Drew Moffat. I am with Arizona Reproductive Medicine Specialists. I am the medical director. And uh, the way to reach us is, uh, the easiest way is just go to our website, arizonafertility.com. And uh, here's another question. Is this like an ERA? That's a very good question. This is uh, conceptually like an ERA. In my Facebook Live session last week, I went over the ERA test in detail. So if you want to understand what the endometrial receptiva test is, just look at my Facebook uh, from last week because I went over that in detail. Um, anyway, the way to contact me is arizonafertility.com. That's arizonafertility.com. Uh, or you can just call our office directly at 602-343-2767. That's 602-343-2767. Also, uh, if you want to have me give you a call back, again, you can just go on our website. We have something called Talk to a Doctor Today. Just look that up, Talk to a Doctor Today. I think it's right on the front page. And you just call the office. You say that you want to talk to me today. And they give me a little slip of paper, say, call this person. Uh, and I call you uh, usually in the evening um, as I'm heading back from work. So again, hope that helps and that's interesting and have a great evening. Bye-bye.